Good evening, everyone. Thanks so much for joining. Uh, we'll wait a few minutes for everybody to get on in, but if you all want to hop in the chat and share um, your name, where you are logging in from, and maybe just one thing you, you like or excited about for spring as a little icebreaker. Hi, my name is uh, Phil, Phil Grasseffa. Um, I'm very excited about uh, helping out with the herring count. Great. Because, uh, I, I grew up near the, the, the Watertown Dam and used to watch those uh, herring from when I was a kid. And it uh, seems to be so, so few these days. It's a little uh, heartbreaking. Yes, but great to great to have you, Phil. Awesome. And for hiking season, trying some new trails, that's great. Right. Great. Well, I think we'll go ahead and get started for all of you folks who are right on time. Um, thank you so much for being here tonight and for signing up to volunteer. We're so looking forward to another um, season of fish monitoring. So I am Lisa. I am CRWA's um, senior Restoration Program Manager, and I'll walk you through some of the training, but we've also got a few great other folks here. Um, we have John Shepard here. John, if you want to give a little wave, um, from the Division of Marine Fisheries, who will be talking about the statewide efforts around fish counting. There's John. Awesome. And we have our um, our volunteer and outreach coordinator from CRWA, Ryan Smith. Ryan, give a little wave. Awesome. He's going to be talking about signing up for your volunteer slots at the end. And then we also have Carly here. She is our communications manager, and she'll be doing all of the tech for this presentation. So if you guys have any issues with um, tech things, please um, you can chat Charlie, di Carly directly or just put your thoughts and info in the chat directly. Great. So we'll get started here. I think we can move on to the next slide. And uh, today we'll talk a little bit about CRWA. I think we see a lot of, I see a lot of familiar faces who um, are often volunteers of ours. So it's great to see you all and some new faces too. So that's fantastic. Um, we'll talk a little bit about river herring and how cool they are and why we're um, here doing this fish count. Hear from John about the statewide monitoring efforts. And then we'll get into the nitty gritty, how you volunteer, um, what it looks like when you go into the Watertown Dam site, and then talk about signing up. Um, and we'll get you all at the end of this training signed up so that you're all set and ready to go. Um, yeah, great. And if at any point you all have questions, feel free to put them directly in the chat. I have slides in between each of these sections for questions as well. So I can answer then what comes in the chat or you can come off of mute at that point um, and ask your questions directly. Great, all right. Well, all about CRWA. So we have come a long way in the cleanup of the Charles River, but we still have more to go. So just a little bit about our organization. Next slide. So we were founded in 1965 and we consider ourselves the voice of the river. Next slide. 
Um, our mission is to protect, restore, and enhance the Charles River and its whole watershed through science, advocacy, and the law. And we also have a focus now on um, pr protecting public health, um, environmental equity, and um, focusing on a changing climate. So our watershed is actually quite large. Um, you may all know it's 308 square miles in Eastern Massachusetts. It goes through um, 35 cities and towns. Parts of those towns are within their watershed and the river directly runs through 23 towns. And there's about a, a million people that live in our watershed. So it's a large area and very important. We have five different program areas that we focus on as part of CRWA's work. Um, we have river science, which is really kind of at the core of our work and informs our different advocacy efforts, and also really particularly informs our um, climate resilience, which is mainly focused on um, adapting our landscape to climate change for the benefit of people. Um, our river restoration program, which is focused on um, adapting our landscape <laughs> um, for, for um, ecology, really, um, is the big focus. And then we have a focus on stormwater solutions as well, which is um, stormwater is really the main source of pollution to the Charles River nowadays. And it takes a lot to... Um, have towns and cities um, reduce the amount of stormwater that's going into the river because it comes from everywhere. So we have a focus on that and we really interweave education and outreach throughout all of our program areas. And this, um, uh, my program area is uh, river restoration, and that's what this fish count is all a part of today. So in restoration, we focus on removing dams, um, tackling invasive species, daylighting, and um, naturalizing stream channels um, in order to uh, restore ecology that has been affected by many hundreds of years of development. Great. So the herring, what are they doing? They are an ecological mir miracle that we get to see every spring, which is really exciting. So why restore herring? Uh, why do we want them to come back in our rivers? They used to be very abundant uh, throughout New England. Um, they are anadromous fish, meaning that they spend their life at sea and um, spawn in rivers from March to June, and then swim back out to the ocean to live most of their lives. They're very ecologically significant, part of the food, food web, and they are also really important to indigenous communities and to maintaining food sovereignty for indigenous communities um, in our watershed. That means the Nipmuc, the Massachusetts, and the Wampanoag people traditionally relied on the Charles River and the alewives that ran up it for their food. And these are some of the migratory fish that we either have in the past or currently see in the Charles River. So American shad is one. They're a little bit bigger. Um, then we have the river herring, alewife herring, and blueback herring. And those are mainly the ones that you all will be counting as part of this. Those are the ones that can get up the fish ladder at the Watertown Dam. We also have rainbow smelt, and we actually saw some last, um, last season congregating below Watertown Dam. And we used to have Atlantic salmon. Um, there are historical accounts of Atlantic salmon in the Charles and actually way up in the Charles up in Rentham. Um, but those have not been, those are essentially extinct, extinct in the Charles River now. <clears throat> so this is just a really nice diagram of the life cycle of a herring. So kind of starting at that light blue, um, herring you can see my migration begins in late spring um, the herring go up into the rivers to spawn and then the 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 herring who are um, mature leave back and go to the ocean while leaving their eggs the eggs incubate and hatch and then grow in fresh water 
And that's where we really need a lot of habitat space for that part of the herring life cycle. And so opening up uh, habitat space throughout our watershed is really a focus of ours. And then those little fry, um, as they're called, um, they migrate back to the ocean downstream in the late summer, early fall time frame. And then um, it takes about two to four years for herring to mature. And once they do mature and reach um, reproductive age, they go back into the rivers where the exact spot where they were um, hatched and spawn again. Um, so we'll, we'll go into this, but you can see that in some of the data when there's been restoration projects about four years after the restoration activity, there's a big jump in herring populations. So um, yeah, I think we, we covered this. So this is just a little bit of history before colonization, 400 years ago at this point, the Charles flowed freely. Um, and this is a picture of a traditional weir that indigenous people used to use in our rivers. This one is out in the, um, out in the ocean or, or a tidal flat area, but a similar type structure was uh, made at Watertown Dam, which is the natural headwaters um, for the Charles when it was an estuary and had salt water coming up into it. Um, and then, of course, the big change in our history was that we built dams in the river um, when the col colonists came. And the first dam to be built in the river in the Charles was actually Watertown Dam in six. 1634, um, it replaced, there was a stone dam that replaced what used to be an indigenous fish weir there. And there has been some sort of dam structure in that location ever since. And now there are many dams that dot the river. And this is showing uh, what our habitat space is now. So right now, really, um, Fish can, migratory fish can make it up through the locks at the end of the Charles um, because we, because the dam, the people who operate that dam let them in. And then they make it all the way up to Watertown Dam. And at that point, some of them make it up the fish ladder, but most of them don't. And especially American Shad really can't make it up the ladder. Um, so essentially two thirds of the migratory fish habitat that was was historically recorded has been lost in the Charles. And so yeah, in 1920, there was actually a declaration that herring and alewives were extinct. Um, and a lot of that was attributed to the industrial pollution um, and the dams that were in the Charles River, which is pretty, it's pretty extreme that that was a declaration. So yes, this is a problem that we can we um, continue to think about. The river is a lot cleaner um, than it was. Um, there's been significant improvement with the Boston Harbor cleanup, um, but we still have these major obstacles for herring. So another reason that um, dams are bad is because they actually really affect the eco the ecosystem in the water and this is um, a nice diagram that shows all of those different effects. So when you put a dam in a river, it's essentially a wall. It cuts off um, that fish passage, of course, for migratory fish as well as fragmenting habitat for all of the other creatures living in the river, including um, resident freshwater fish. Um, it causes sedimentation and uh, still water area in the area behind the dam, which we call the impoundment. And that um, causes invasive plant growth. Um, that's an area where excess nutrients are. Um, and the, in those areas, temperature rises, um, we get cyanobacteria blooms, and we have low dissolved oxygen levels, which is inhospitable for um, aquatic life. Um, this is a nice quote that one of our former staffers got um, in 
uh, in, in, I think the Watertown dam or the Watertown news newspaper a few years ago, but really a dam is like a river and it's a, it's a blocked artery, like a heart attack. And when you take down the dam, it solves that issue, which is really impressive. So CRWA is focused on um, removing dams where they are no longer serving a purpose. And um, most of the dams in our watershed do not serve a purpose. A couple do, notably the New Charles Dam, which is at the locks um, at the most downstream part of the Charles. And the Moody Street Dam also is a purpose. Um, it serves a, a flood control purpose. So we're not advocating for the removal of those, but we would advocate for appropriate fish passage at each of those, um, which, yeah, which we are. And these are some of the ones South Natick Dam and Watertown Dam that we're focused on right now. And South Natick Dam is actually in the process of um, engineering design for dam removal. And it was voted um, in favor of dam removal after a two year process where the town looked at the possibilities for either keeping and repairing the dam because it needed to be repaired or removing it. But they decided to move forward with removal. Um, so we're really trying to build this movement to restore fish passage and heal the river ecosystem. It is complex in such an urban environment like around the Charles but um, that's why it takes a, a whole village of people. And we've engaged a lot, especially around Watertown Dam with the residents of Watertown. Um, some of y'all might be involved in that effort and you all can get more involved too, if you're interested, but just doing the fish count is very important for making the case for this dam removal and also tracking the progress that we will have towards restoration of this important um, habitat space as, as it opens up. So yeah, by counting fish, you're helping us advocate for river restoration. So essentially you all will be conducting a 10 minute observation um, and we will collect that data at CRWA and send it then to the Division of Marine Fisheries to John. And he analyzes the data and um, comes up with a full count number. And that will help us again with the advocacy to remove these um, defunct dams. So just a quick graph from last year's counting, if some of, some of you I know were involved, but we had a shorter time period last year because it was our first year bringing back um, a counting volunteer program in um, many, many years since the early 2000s. And so we ended up having counts from April 28th to June 18th. We engaged 54 volunteers. So thank you all for your efforts. Um, and we had 249 observations made. So um, at, during those 10 minute shifts, overall 3000 or so fish were counted. You can see they kind of came in these two major waves around the um, May 7th, and then again um, at the end of May, May 23rd or so. And the estimate from, from John of the um, fish that were there um, was around 43,000 in total. And I think John, it will talk more about that. Great, next slide. All right, I want to stop here for any questions that you all may have before I turn it over to John. And feel free to come off of mute or put something in the chat, whatever you feel more comfortable with. Yeah, Phil, Philip. Um, how far up uh, the Charles do they go to spawn? Is it one location or they, they spawn all along the way or? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, they they spawn, there's certain habitats that they're more, um, there are certain types of like bed that they're more likely to spawn in. I'll let John take a better uh, shot at that. But really right now there are, um, the barriers are what are, um, are limiting how far up they can go. So right now we don't see much, much uh, activity further up than the Watertown Dam. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, if I could, uh, John, go ahead. yeah, if I could, yeah, uh, if I could 
uh, take a stab at that too. So, um, so as as Lisa showed in uh, her her fig her uh, her maps, you know, a lot of the historical habitat um, is unavailable for for river herring, particularly owl wives. Um, one thing that's ecologically different between the two species is, um, especially in watersheds like the Charles, where both species exist. Um, Owlwives and blueback herrings have different um, habitats for, uh, they prefer different habitats for spawning. Uh, Owlwives particularly prefer um, uh, like ponds and lakes, um, largely, you know, slow, uh, you know, slow still water environments. Um, and largely because of that, because of the situation in the Charles where a lot of that um, habitat in the upper parts of the watershed are, are largely unavailable, um, they'll They'll wind up um, looking for areas like uh, 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 things like uh, eddies or not eddies, but like uh, lagoons, um, you know, areas outside the main stem of the river where you have slower um, or still water areas that could be uh, areas where they can spawn in. Blueback herring, by contrast, tend to prefer river rind sections, so they'll they'll spawn in the main stem parts of the river and even some offshoots as well. Thanks, John. And I see one more question in the chat. Why do you think there were spikes on May 7th and 23rd? John, do you want to take a stab at that? Uh, hard to really say. Um, I would, you know, sometimes that can be, uh, a lot of times you'll, you'll see, um, with looking at data and looking at, um, uh, daily passage, um, you know, oftentimes, you know, migrations will occur in waves like that, um, especially, um, especially in a, say, in a watershed like the Charles, where you have owlwives and you have bluebacks. A lot of times the early, um, the early wave that you'll see oftentimes tends to be owlwife, because uh, they tend to enter rivers earlier, uh, when water temperatures are a little bit cooler, um, this is, you know, this is kind of a, a general rule, but it's it's not absolute, you know, because um, it, it can vary from uh, watershed to watershed. But oftentimes river, um, temperature can be um, a very important driver of of river herring movements. Um, you know, usually when temperatures get around 10 degrees or 50 Celsius or 50 degrees Fahrenheit, oftentimes that triggers a um, uh, particularly our wives to start moving to start uh, migrating uh, blueback herring they tend to come they tend to enter the river a little bit later when temperatures are a little bit warmer um, and so when just kind of looking at that graph that Lisa showed um, you know from last year's counts where you, you saw two spikes um, you know uh, I don't work directly with the Charles myself um, it's kind of out of my area but just kind of looking at that and just knowing that, you know, you have both species, what you could be seeing there is possibly that early spike being an owlwife, uh, an owlwife uh, migration coming in. And then that later one that you saw towards the end of May, you know, could be a blueback. Um, and I would, I would suspect that it's probably a temperature, um, a temperature difference um, that you're seeing that's probably influencing that distribution. Awesome. All right. I'm answering a few of the questions in the chat um, live, um, but I think we should move on to John's presentation. Great. And John, if you want to share that. And Cece, I think we'll get back to your question. I think that is better for after John presents. Okay, I'll need to uh, I'll need permission to uh, share. Okay, should be all set. Okay.
Okay, can everyone see this? Mm -hmm. Hopefully, okay. Okay, so again, my name is John Shepard. I work with the Massachusetts Division of Marine Fisheries, and I work for the Diagemus Fisheries uh, Project. And within our project, um, we focus on biology, uh, monitoring, management, and the restoration of diagemous fish species. And so for today, um, and so I'm gonna go over these uh, various um, topics here. So I'll just give a brief overview of visual counting and then I'll talk about the principles for conducting visual counts, as well as uh, sampling designs to statistically treat um, this data. And then I'll talk about the uh, the visual counting program that we use. I'll come up with some general recommendations. And at the end, I'll show you just a few case studies and then discuss some of the limitations of visual count data. So river herring monitoring and counting here in Massachusetts, it goes back as far as 1980. And so shown here, there's a map of coastal Massachusetts along with summary statistics for herring counting that was conducted last year. And so in 2023, we had over 48 locations that were counted. Um, we use a variety of methods, but um, as you can see from the map, if you see all the green tacks on the map, um, Visual counting is the most commonly used method. It comprises over 60% of all locations monitored. And so this is done primarily and mostly by citizen scientists. And so citizen scientists can make significant contributions to monitoring and counting. Um, in 2023 alone, 90% of the streams were either monitored solely by volunteers or with the assistance of volunteers. And so you know, these volunteers, they, they come from all types of organizations, including, you know, municipalities, um, commissions, watershed associations, non-government, and even private organizations. So here, what I want to talk about is I want to talk about, you know, some of the principles for conducting visual counts. And so the initial concept for estimating river herring populations using visual counts was conducted by a gentleman named Rideout and Company as part of his graduate research. This was done actually in the 1970s and it was actually conducted on the Parker River in Northern Massachusetts. And so what I have here is I just have a, a rough diagram that kind of summarizes uh, Rideout's concept. So if you look at the diagram here um, on the X axis, you have time, which is basically it's the uh, duration of the spawning uh, of the spawning season. And then what you would do is that each day you would divide um, each day into sampling periods. And so if you look on the Y axis here, we have a 12 hour visual observation period. And so say from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. And then on the opposite Y axis where, you, where it says N, this like in theory would be like the number of fish that were counted. Um, and so if you look at the curve on the graph here, let's say this is your theoretical run. And so basically what you would then do is you would conduct visual counts, say 10 minute counts. You would conduct them randomly each day throughout the spawning season. And so here on this graph here, the counts that are on, that are inside the curve here, let's say those are counts where fish were observed. And then the count, the shaded blocks, these are 10 minute observation, uh, 10 minute counts where no fish were observed. So in order to come up with these estimates, um, you would have to come up with a mean daily passage rate and you would estimate that from your visual counts conducted each day. And then those though that that mean daily passage rate would be extracted would be extrapolated over the daily observation period to provide an estimate of daily passage so i just have an example here so let's say on day x um you conducted four visual counts and of those four 10 minute visual counts uh three of them were done where fish were observed and then you had one count where fish were not observed so to come up with your um daily passage rate, you would take an, you would take the cumulative sum of the number of fish that were observed in those counts. You would divide it by the total number of observations, and that would give you your number per 10-minute count. And then 
to come up with the daily estimate, you would take that you would take that estimate, you would multiply it, you know, by six, that would give you your count per hour. And then you would then take it, take that count and you would, um, you would then uh, multiply that by your daily observation period, which in this case, it would be a 12 hour observation period. And that would give you your estimate of daily passage. So to come up with your estimate of run size, you know, the total population estimate, it would be the cumulative sum of that, of your daily, uh, your estimates of daily passage. So one thing to kind of con to consider when you're conducting a visual count is, um, you know, one question you should ask yourself rather is, you know, what, what do you, what aim, what type of estimate are you aiming to achieve here? And so what I have here, I have three maps that show three different scenarios here. This, the one on the left here, the black and white map, this is a, this is actually the Monument River. This is in Plymouth and Bourne. And actually it's um, what the, we refer to as the Cape Cod Canal Run because the, uh, the river actually empties into the canal. And so if you look at the location of the red arrow, that's actually where the counting station is. It's right it's right by the outlet where it actually empties into the canal. And so this is actually, um, this is actually one where we actually use an electronic fish counter to count. And so the estimate that we get here is basically an estimate of the total population. Um, if you look at the example here in the middle, this is the uh, Namaskat River in Middleborough. This is a tributary to the Taunton River. Um, if you look at the uh, where the arrow is located, it's located roughly halfway um, along the course of the river. And so what and so the estimate that you would achieve here is what we would refer to as an escapement effort um, estimate. Basically, it's not an estimate of the total population because we know that there are some species that are there are some, you know, there is a portion of the population that does not um, migrate past this point. So. This estimate of escapement is basically it's the number of fish that are passing beyond a certain you know location within the river, and then the final example here at uh, uh, C, um, this is the Akushnet River. Um, this is a, a a watershed that's undergone extensive restoration efforts, uh, where we did fish passage improvements along three locations on the river, and so the red arrow is actually where the sampling where the uh, the counting location is it's all the way up at the reservoir here so this one here is actually what i would refer to as a restoration response because we have data that we have we have monitoring data prior to these fish passage improvements and then we've been monitoring since uh fish passage improvements basically to look at the response of river herring um the numbers that are actually getting up into the primary spawning habitat. So when you think of the Charles River and where your counting location is, and this, you know, being at the Watertown Dam, and as Lisa, you know, referred to in her presentation, you know, there's a portion of the population that is able to get up and past, uh, you know, the dam here, whereas, you know, there's a portion that is not. And so in this look, in this um, situation, you know, basically the estimate that you would be looking at would be would fall under the scenario of B, an escapement. So, um, so you know, many counting groups they try to adhere to ride out sampling scheme, but the required daily coverage um, and hourly sampling is often not achieved and it's due to a variety of reasons, whether you have ins an insufficient number of volunteers or troubles with scheduling counts, et cetera. And so for these reasons, um, one of my colleagues, um, Gary Nelson, he's a uh, stock assessment biology and a, a statistician. He conducted a, a review of basic statistical concepts to develop alternative sampling designs for use by volunteer groups to estimate river herring populations using visual counts. And so this is actually um, this is actually available as a technical report on our website. And uh, I actually have the uh, the link um, and the or the uh, the web address at the end of this presentation. But um, the technical report, it provides guidelines to define sampling periods and the number of counts to be conducted within each period. And so what I have here is I have three different um, sampling designs here. So if you look at the one on the left, this is what we refer to as a one-way uh, stratified random sampling design. 
And under this design, you would have, you know, a defined daily observation period. And in this case, in this example, it's, you know, from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. And so you would conduct a minimum of two counts within, you know, each daily observation period. If you go to the one in the middle, this is what we refer to as a two-way, two-period um, sampling design. So under this scenario, you're taking the same daily observation period, that, that 12 hours, but you're dividing it up into two six-hour sub-periods. And, and within these two six-hour periods, you're conducting a minimum of two counts. And then when you go to the third, the one on the right, this is what we this is referred to as a two-way three period. It's much like the two-way two period, except you're actually dividing your 12 hours into three four-hour sub-periods, and then you're conducting a minimum of three counts within each of those four-hour periods. And so if you look at the different sampling designs here, you'll notice that as you're um as you're going from the one way to the two-way three period. You're seeing that you know that the, you're seeing more coverage. You're seeing more areas that are getting um, that are being counted, and there's less time that's that's passed that where you're not getting observations. And so, in general, we favor this two-way, three-period design because the more counting periods and the more counts that you conduct randomly within each period, the more statistically accurate your estimates will be. <clears throat> And so along with these sampling designs and protocols that are outlined in our in this report, we also developed a visual basic program to estimate both daily and total run sites using visual count sampling data. And so I just have some screenshots here of this is actually an older version of the uh, of the program, but um, but basically, you know, the upper left, you see it's a, basically a main menu. Um, the upper right, this is actually a, a um, an entry field where you actually enter in your input data. And then on the lower left, this is just an example of some of the output data that you can um, gain from this program. So to generate um, estimates of daily passage as well as total population estimates, the program requires the following input data. It needs the date, the start time, the end time, and the number of fish that were counted. But um, the program can also generate summary statistics and graphics on environmental data as well. So, for example, like you can go out, you can collect air temperature, you can collect water temperature and even weather conditions. And that's great data to have. Um, uh, and you can also get, you know, um, the output. Um, you can get mean uh, daily temperatures. Um, you can get it in both as like Excel tables as well as graphs that are kind of shown here. But um, this data is optional, and it's not actually required to generate the run size estimates. And so this is just another example of some of the output uh, summary statistics um, that are shown. This is actually a newer uh, version of the visual count program. And so what I have here, this is one example. This is the Herring River and Wall Fleet. This is an 11-year time series of data. And so we generate summary statistics of, of you know, of the counting uh, effort for each year. And so that's kind of shown in the table here below. So you can get, you know, for example, you know, the first day of the year in which counts occurred, the last day of the year. And so that gives you the duration of, of, of the run or the counts that were done, the number of days where you had missing counts, as well as days where you had an insufficient number of counts, as well as, you know, the daily observation period. And so, this actually, this information is actually important when we go to QA, uh, QCR data and review it, because uh, one of the big things that we're looking for um, with visual count data is that we're trying to um, generate indices that, you know, um, when you when you look at time series data or data over these indices over time, um, we want to try to keep these in indices or these metrics as consistent as possible. And so if you look at the two figures up on the top, the first one shows the, um, this is the range of the daily counting period. So for example, like if you have a 12 hour counting period um, for each day, um, we look to try and make sure that that's consistent for all years, as well as the um, uh, the duration of which the counts occur. So it's like the, you know, the number of days in, in each year, we try to maintain um, consistent metrics and so, when you look at the two graphs, 
two figures up at the top, you'll see that a portion of them is uh, highlighted in yellow. And so this is basically a, a way we, this is basically a method in which we use to standardize the data uh, for, for a statistical analysis. And so oftentimes, you know, uh, counts that occur outside of those um, yellow regions, you know, will um, actually omit those from the analysis. Here's just another example of the output data here. So on the left, these are estimated daily counts from the Herring River and Wellfleet. And then on the right, these are the estimates of, of these are the estimates of total run size for each year. Um, again, the program can also produce these uh, numbers, these estimates as, um, as tables. Um, this is just the graphs that I'm showing you here. Um, so um, when we, we made this, when we uh, came up with this technical report, this was actually derived from a meeting that we had in 2005, where we met with uh, local watershed groups, uh, herring wardens, and other um, and other organizations that were that were doing visual counts at the time, and so they gave us information from their individual runs, and so we took all this information from this workshop, we synthesized it all, and we came up with the with the following recommendations, and so the first one being that uh, that you know counting programs follow a two way stratified random sampling design, in which they would make a minimum of three 10 minute counts during each of three daily observation periods. So if, for example, if you use a 12 hour daily observation period, you would divide it up into three four hour periods, and then you would conduct you know, a minimum of three counts within each of those four hour periods. And then you would wanna conduct your counts every day throughout the entire spring spawning run. So what I'm going to show you here is I'm going to I just have a few case studies that I'm just going to show you. And these are examples of runs that were shown to have good quality data. And so for each of these slides, I'm going to show you the run size estimates, uh, which is the graph on the top, as well as the sampling coverage. In this case, that's the graph in the middle. In this case, this is the number of samples that are co that are collected at each sampling interv interval throughout each daily observation period. And then down below, this is what we call a power analysis. And so what a power analysis is, is that it's a statistical technique that's used to um, determine the probability of being able to detect changes um, over time, given the level of sampling int uh, intensity. So um, uh, this first example here, this is the Mystic River. Um, this is a 10 year time series of data, which, you know, um, unfortunately, we had one missing year 2020. That was the, uh, you know, that was the pandemic. And so no counts were conducted at that time. But um, the uh, the group that monitors this run here, you know, they um, they use a two way, three period stratified random sampling design, as we recommend. Um, and so I just have these are just um, the graph. Uh, in the middle graph here, these are the number of counts for each um, sampling interval throughout each daily observation period. And as you can see, each, you know, each um, interval here is, you know, throughout the duration of the of the counting, you know, is is fairly evenly represented here, you know, which ideally that's what you would like to see. And so when you look at the power analysis down below, you'll see it's a V-shaped curve. And it's a it's a very it's a rather sh uh, sharp V shaped curve, which is ideally what you want to see because basically what it's showing you is that the probability of being able to detect you know change over time is high, and so this is one this is a counting this is a visual count but they also augment this with a video monitoring system and because they have you know ten years of 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 data here this. Um, this data set has the potential to be included into both state and federal stock assessments. This is my next example here. This is the Namaskat River. Again, this is the, uh, one of the ones that I showed you on the map for sampling locations. Um, this is actually one of our larger uh, coastal runs in Massachusetts. Uh, this is a 19 year time series. Um, now here, it's a little different. They actually use a two way, two period stratified sampling design. Um, as you can see, most of the counts tend to be centered around the early afternoon hours. Um, however, they, you know, they they put in a lot of um, 
a lot of counts and this is and over the the course of this 19 year time series you know this is you know this trend you know this trend in counts is very uh consistent and it actually shows with the power analysis down below you can see it's a it's a sharp v-shaped curve this system um along with the counts is also augmented with uh biological sampling this is actually one of the stations that we use that we collect biological samples from as well as the mystic river too and <clears> so for these reasons um this um this data set it actually is um included the most recent stock assessment for shad and for river herring and then the last example that I have here, this is the Marsons Mill River. This is down on the Cape. Um, this is an 11 year time series. And again, if you if you look at the middle graph here, as you can see, um, the number of counts for each uh, you know, hour of of the day um, you know, is you know, well represented. It has, you know, you know, the statistical power is also very high here as well. Um and so this is also another potential candidate for inclusion into coastwide stock assessments as well. So the last thing I want to talk to you before I wrap up is I just want to talk about some of the limitations of this data. Um, one thing that's important to keep in mind with conducting visual counts and the run size estimates that are extrapolated from it is that these estimates, they're not true population estimates. So if so, because uh, basically, you know, because you're only, um, you know, you're conducting counts within a 12 hour period. And when you run the extrapolation, it's only extrapolating for the number of fish that are, you know, in theory, passing within that daily observation period. So it's not 24 hours. Um, you know, that can only really be achieved by, um, you know, uh, using a higher technology, either like an electronic fish counter or a video monitoring system. So the estimates that you derive from visual counts, they're more indices of abundance, which, you know, if the metrics are consistent, you know, over time, you know, you can then track these indices and you can determine, you know, you can look for trends over time, you know, is the population increasing? Is it decreasing? Is it remaining stable? Um, one of the other uh, limitations about this data is that the counts may not account for changes in phenology. So what is phenology? Phenology is the timing of certain life history events. You know, you think of things like uh, migrations of monarch butterflies, um, you know, when um, when flowers start budding and, and things like that. And so in, in this case, you know, the timing of the adult uh, spawning migration is a phenological event. And so... Um, some of the some recent studies that you know DMF has conducted in conjunction in conjunction with um, UMass Amherst and the Northeast Climate Action Science Center, um, they've shown that you know looking at um, uh, river herring uh, migratory patterns, you know, using a lot of this data over time in several Massachusetts coastal rivers, we've been seeing that there's been a, a trend towards you know earlier migrations. Um, over the course of of some of these um, over the course of some of these uh, data sets, and so when you if you're keeping a consistent um, uh, monitoring period, you know it may or may not you know account for these changes. So what I usually say to groups is that they oftentimes groups will ask me the question, you know, when should we start counting? Um, the thing is, is that every watershed is different. Some start earlier than others and some start later. Um, I always recommend that they, um, you know, they go out and they start counting as soon as they, you know, as soon as they suspect fish are arriving. Um, now, you know, we may not necessarily, um, you know, include some of that data when we run our analyses for the sake of maintaining consistency with our metrics, but it is important to document these changes. Um, Furthermore, speaking of, of migra migration patterns, you know, the counts may not account for changes in deal migrations. And that's by deal meaning like um, migrating over the course of a day. Um, so, for example, you know, uh, some runs, you know, you see a lot of activity that occurs, you know, almost what I kind of refer to as like the magic hours. If you think of it as a from a fisherman's point of view, oftentimes fishermen say one of the best times to fish is, you know, at dawn and at dusk. It's like when you're seeing that changes changes in light patterns, 
And so some runs oftentimes, um, you know, the herring will oftentimes uh, exhibit similar behavior. In some runs, you know, you see a lot of activity, you know, early in the morning when the sun's coming up and sometimes in the evening when the sun's going down. Um, there are some runs where, you know, you see a lot of activity that occurs at night. Um, so every every run can be different in that way. And so, you know, if you have a set daily observation period, you may not be capturing some of those um, some of those periods where you where movement is occurring. Um, it can be challenging to maintain consistent count metrics, um, you know, daily observation periods, um, the uh, the duration of which counts occur year after year. And oftentimes it can also be difficult to maintain volunteer involvement. Um, you know, it, it can take a lot of effort to organize counting groups and especially in places where you have small runs. Um, oftentimes, you know, people are going out there and they're counting and they're not seeing anything. And so a lot of times people lose interest. Um, the one thing I do try to stress to volunteer counting groups is that if they're going out there and they're not seeing anything, that data is still important. You know, those zeros are still important data. It gives us information about, you know, the uh, the migratory behavior and the pattern on which runs are occurring, you know, because some, some runs, like I said, they occur, you know, depending on, you know, uh, temperatures, depending on, um, on light, um, as well as, you know, some of them have a tidal component, especially if you're conducting counts near um, the outlet of the rivers towards the ocean. A lot of times, you know, their movements can be tide dependent as well. So, um, you know, these are different things that I try to, um, you know, uh, express to volunteers. <clears throat> and so with that, you know, you know, as uh, Lisa also said, too, you know, with a lot of these efforts, it takes a village and, you know, it takes, um, you know, We've had help from all different types of organizations, state and federal, uh, private organizations, watershed groups, municipalities, and most of all, you know, to citizen scientists, you know, to which we, you know, I would say we really owe the most thanks. So down below is our website, um, you know, that, that, uh, that River Herring uh, Sampling Guide, there's the link there, and um, I'll try to take any questions if you have any. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. That was really helpful. Do folks have questions for John? I tried, this was actually an abridged version of my uh, my presentation. I'm, I didn't want to put everyone to sleep with a bunch of stats and, and things like that, so. This was great. And you all can kind of see that we're we're really new in this really exciting time period. So this is just the second year that we're really following these protocols and there's a lot of precedent for it. And hopefully soon enough, we'll have 10 years worth of data like the other groups. Awesome. Okay, Alton, I see your hand. Um, hi, yeah, I had a question because this, this would be my first time. And um, I thought in the, um, in the email that I was answering, it indicated something pretty small, like 10 minutes a week. Is that true? Um, but but in, in the analysis or in the explanation of the counting methods, you look like when we want to be out there for a day. So I'm confused about that. Yeah, so the idea there, I'll take that. So the idea there is that you're only counting for 10 minutes during a one hour time slot. And we're hoping that everybody can commit at least um, at least to that one hour time slot, but only counting for 10 minutes within that. Um, and then we hope to fill 12 slots a day, essentially. So we'll talk a little bit more about scheduling um, in a minute. Okay, thanks. Um, how do three or four observers count the fish? Okay. So um, yeah, go I ahead. <laughs> um, uh, so typically what I would, what I would have is, um, you know, uh, basically I would, I would basically, you know, one person at a time, um, you know, I would have, you know, one person, you know, counting. Um, one thing that's important, um, is that, um, 
And this is something that can be a complicating factor sometimes, especially when you get into uh, into the later stages of the run, because in a lot of rivers um, or in a lot of situations, you know, passage is only possible through one point. So, for example, like at the Watertown Dam, you're 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 counting at the exit of the fish ladder there. Um, now. And in a lot in a lot of cases, it's actually not a bad situation because what I what I was actually uh, referring to is that um, in some places um, where you're counting is where the um, that's the only way for fish to come up and for fish to go down. So when you get into the later, later stages of the run, you come into a situation where you have fish that are actually might they're actually passing downstream. Um, so really, what you want is you want to just count the fish that are going upstream. Um, you know, if you have fish that are going downstream that, you know, you don't want to count those because that can really that that confounds your count. Um, so you just want you just want, you know, you just want to count up migrating fish. Um, you know, generally, um, you try not to do you try to you try to avoid consecutive counts. So like if you have a group of three or four people, um, you know, Sometimes people would be like, okay, I'll do 10 minutes and then this person does 10 minutes and then this person does 10 minutes and so forth. Um, what that does though is that that statistically we 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 don't favor that because that mm -hmm. that actually leads to what we call aggregate or cluster sampling. So it's like where you're concentrating your effort within a specific time period. And so we 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 for statistical purposes, we try to randomize the count as much as possible. So, I mean, I guess really to try to answer that question, I would just basically, you would have, you would designate one person to conduct the count. <clears throat> and you want to count just fish passing up, not going down. Yeah, which shouldn't be an issue in our location since we'll be uh, looking at fish coming up the ladder. and, and Yeah, fish and because in the majority of them will be going over the spillway. Yeah, yeah, yeah so that's... Yeah. That's good. I mean, because that's a common problem you see next door at the Mystic, because, you know, they're counting at the ladder, you know, between upper and lower, or between the they're counting at the ladder going into a uh, lower Mystic Lake there, uh, from lower to upper Mystic Lake. And so it's the only way for fish to go up and down, really. So that's that's often a problem that they encounter. <clears throat> Great. All right. I think I want to move on because I know some folks may have to hop off at eight. Um, hopefully everyone can stay for another 10 or 15 minutes. Um, we'll get into the nitty gritty of the counting and signing up for your slot, which hopefully we can do live. Great. All right. Thanks, John. All right. So how we count. So at our location, we'll be at the Watertown Dam, um, which is uh, off of and the fish ladder side. And so that's the south side of the river, which is off of California Street. Um, we're going to sign up for one hour shifts for 12 hours, and you only need to count for 10 minutes during that time period. We're hoping that people can try to keep to a regular-ish schedule. Um, so signing up for the same shift every week, but understanding that that's not always going to be the case. Um, so we'll go through how to do that sign up. Um, these observations were made at the at the viewing platform above um, where basically the fish come out of the fish ladder. So at the top of the dam. And again, to reemphasize that count of zero that John mentioned is still really useful data and that will happen. You'll all count zero um, and we'll see when when the fish come through. I think the the largest count of 10 minutes last year was uh, in the range of 350 fish coming up in 10 minutes. Wow. So hopefully you'll be the lucky person to, to get that this year. <laughs> All right, so supplies that you need, all you need to bring with you really is a cell phone. Um, and that's gonna be important for um, making sure that you record the data and you'll do that via a Google form, which we'll talk more about. All of the other materials will be in a box right next to the um, 
viewing platform that you will have access to. So this includes a clicker, um, a timer, so you can set the timer for 10 minutes, um, sunglasses, which can be useful for seeing through the water, especially on a, on a really sunny, um, reflecty day, although our location is pretty shaded, so that's usually helpful, um, but really bring, bring your cell phone, which of course most people have all the time anyways. Great. So this is the location that you'll go to. I recommend parking along um, California Street if you're going by car. Um, if you're going by bike, there's plenty of places to put your bike up and there's a very nice walking path. I'm sure most of you have been to this location before. Um, so really, it's it's a great uh, a great way to do these counts is to integrate it into your you know daily activity. Maybe every evening you go for a walk along this segments or you commute by bike along this area every morning, um, stop and do a 10 minute count. So um, the actual location of this, um, you'll see there's kind of a walkway up to the top of the fish ladder where you'll see a fence. So you'll walk up there. Um, there is a little temporary fence that was used to be guarding some new plantings, which um, have now fallen into disrepair. I've talked to DCR about this. And don't worry about, um, we'll, we'll make sure all of this info is easy and accessible. Um, and I'll be sending this out um, after this presentation too. There will be the box there um, and it will be locked to the fence that's along the water. Um, you can go to the next slide. There's a code to get into the box. It's just a, a bike um, lock that we have, 4641. And all the supplies will be found in there. So then when you're actually viewing, you're viewing through a fence and you can see DMF is gonna install this um, basically white, um, Plexi material right underneath where the fish will be coming, which makes it lo a lot easier to see the fish coming up the ladder. And they will be swimming from right to left in terms of how you are viewing it here. And so you'll be looking at this and counting with your clicker every fish that comes through right to left. And um, you'll see this is also right here, there, there's a, um, a white boom that floats on the surface. And the idea of that is just to keep any leaves or um, debris that is coming down the river away from the start of the fish ladder so it doesn't clog it up. So when you get there, you're ready to do your count. You wanna set your clicker to zero. You wanna set your timer to 10 minutes. Make a note of the time that you start the count because you will need to record this on the data sheet on your phone. Um, you can start the data sheet and just record it right there. Click go on your timer and start counting. <laughs> and you'll count for 10 minutes. So we have a data sheet that you will be able to access here. We will also post it on our on our um, website so you can have it. We'll also have in the box a, um, a QR code there that you can scan that goes directly to the data sheet so that you won't have to, you know, you'll, you can find it there easily every time. And um, I can take a minute to go through this data sheet if folks are interested. It's pretty easy and self-explanatory, but maybe um, Carly, can I just share my screen for a few minutes? Or actually, I think maybe there's, okay, yeah, no, I'll just go through it real quick. Okay. So can folks see this? Mm -hmm. So this is what the data sheet looks like. So you'll enter your first and last name. Um, choose the day of the week. Um, so John mentioned the, the quality assurance of the data. We will go through and make sure that your data makes sense if there are any typos or things like that on the dates. Um, this day of the week helps us catch any of that. So that's really helpful. Um, you'll put in the date. You'll put in the time that you started the count and the time that you ended the count. Please make sure that your AM and PM are correct, especially for noon. That's a common issue that we see. Um, 
and that you really do have 10 minutes between these. So if this is 9.52, then this needs to be, well, that's a bad example. Don't do 9.52. If this is 9.42, then your end time will be 9.52. Um, and then how many fish should you count? And then you will um, also, we have, John mentioned some accessory data. We collect um, air temperature and water temperature data as well. And we have a thermometer that is posted on the fence that um, we have a picture of in the next slide that I'll show. And then you'll wanna note the weather as well. And this is um, important data for DMF. So the amount of cloud, cloud cover, if it's a clear day all the way to, Drizzle, light rain, um, moderate rain, sleet and snow, hopefully not. And then any comments that you have, this really is a helpful place for us to put anything around um, that has to do with um, the weather or the conditions that you see. If you have comments that are more about um, the method all or the the methods or like you have a scheduling change that you need or you need materials, um, please just email me those comments because I won't um, be checking this for those types of comments every day. Okay. And Carly, you can share again. Great. Great. Yep, so this will be the data you record. So this is a picture here of the thermometer that we have up, old school style. Um, so we have um, one of the probes is in the air and the other is in the water. And it says on the data sheet whether you're reading the indoor or outdoor temperature, the red or the blue. So hopefully that will be clear. Um, we will, I do want you all to record it in Fahrenheit and then we convert that when we send the data to Division of Marine Fisheries, but it's a good um, it's a good gut check for you all if or and for us when we receive the data of like oh yeah okay that makes sense that it's this temperature in Fahrenheit. Um, great, and then clean up when you're done with the fish count. Clean up your supplies. Relock the box for the next group and the next individual. All right, questions about that, and then we'll talk about scheduling. It's pretty straightforward. You're literally just counting fish for 10 minutes. <laughs> so, All right, let's, oh yeah, sorry. Was there a question? Ask, so you're, you're signing up for a one hour slot, but you can arrive at, like you don't have to be there for that whole hour. You just have to show up within that hour and be there for at least 10 minutes. That's correct. Okay, thank you. And so the idea um, that John shared was that we space out our time a little bit. And so we generally try not to have folks, you know, if you'll never, you'll never exactly know if you're, you know, getting there two minutes after the last person leaves um, and that will happen and that's okay. Um, but generally um, this is a way to space out the timing. Um, Anne says, I noticed last year that the water temperature sometimes didn't seem accurate. Is it measured right at the surface? It is measured right at the surface, so it will be fairly warm. Um, I'll try to adjust that next year. Thank you for noting that, Anne. All right, let's do scheduling. And for this part, um, is Ryan still here? Yes, I'm here. All right, so Ryan is going to go over this. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, so this year, we're doing the scheduling a little bit differently for those of you who joined us last year. Um, so we're hoping that this system is going to be a little bit simpler and easier for people to use. Um, we are still piling it, though, so any feedback that you have during the process is definitely like greatly appreciated. Um, and so essentially, the calendar format we're using this year is called pick time and I am going to actually share my screen with you all and I'm actually just going to take us through how you might um I, I call it booking or but scheduling your kind of time slots essentially um let's see if I have the ability to share my screen 
Perfect. All right. So can everyone see this? All right. Perfect. So easiest thing to do, you can go to crwa.org. Go to our main page. When you go to our Get Involved, you'll see our volunteer section. And then from there, you'll see our Heron Cow. You can also go directly to the link, which is um, crwa.org forward slash fish dash count. Um, and this is going to be kind of your home base for all of your, your uh, fish monitoring needs, essentially. Um, so as you can see, we have, you know, where you signed up for this training and to register. Um, there's some more information and graphics, but the important thing for right now is at the very bottom, we have um, the links to where you can go to pick up your, your time slots. Um, so when you go to the schedule now, it'll open up a new tab um, to our pick time page and you should see this screen. Um, and it's uh, essentially your book, it's to think of it like you're booking an appointment with, um, with us basically. Um, so from there, you can then choose which dates. So for this, our first sampling date or monitoring date would be April 15th. And you can see all the available um, time slots that we have. Um, and that will go the same for any of them throughout this week. So we've got, say, I wanted to um, schedule the 7 a.m. to 8, yeah, the 7 a.m. time slot. I would click that. I could put in my name, my email. Those are really the only two required um, parameters. Or, and then all you do is you hit book appointment. And so from there, it'll tell you your booking is confirmed. You should receive a confirmation email. Um, and then it'll also give you the option to then book again. Um, and that's kind of important um, because we are unable to do recurring appointments. So you kind of do have to go through a little bit more manually and kind of book out ahead, as far ahead of time as you can, ideally, um, all the time slots that you are able to monitor for. Um, the good thing about this kind of flexibility, though, is if, you know, you were, you're able to be like, all right, I can monitor for the next three weeks, but I know I've got this barbecue on the fourth week, and but I'm back on track for the fifth week. And so you can kind of, um, it's a little more custom and easy for you to pick exactly what you're actually going to be able to commit to. Um, and if you're, you know, if you're really loving fish monitoring, you could, you know, pick up two, two bookings in a week or something like that. Um, so it, we're hoping that this time around, it'll give you a little more flexibility be a little bit more clear. Um, and if I do remember correctly, it will send you the option to set up a Google Calendar um, in that confirmation email as well for those of you who do use Google Calendar. Um, and we also will be setting up uh, reminder emails for everyone as well in case uh, in case it can get a, people's calendars can get a little hectic sometimes. Um, does anyone have questions about this? Um, there are is also uh, in the slides we'll be giving, I recorded myself booking this. Um, it's very simple, but in case anyone likes to follow like a, a video tutorial, as well as like a step-by-step -step breakdown with screenshots will also be available to everyone in case you need a reminder at any point. A couple questions about canceling. Canceling. Are you able to cancel? Yes, yeah. In the confirmation email you get, you can, um, There's. it's a little bit harder to see, but it's down at the bottom towards the end of the, confirmation email, um, but it's just, you click a button and it cancels very quickly. There's not too many steps to cancel. Uh, Philip, I see your hand is up. Yes, um, so the expectation is to uh, do a count at least one day a week, but one can do as many days a week as one wants to. Is that is that what you expect from the volunteer? It, that's not clear to me. No, so the idea is that you'll you'll count once a week, not one day or one yes, one day per week, every week essentially. That's mm -hmm. that's what we're hoping for. But if you want to count more often, maybe you want to count on Saturdays and Sundays because you go on a walk, um, you know, every day during the weekend, then that's great as well. Another thing that we saw from last season was that people. Um, wanted to just kind of fill in where 
um, there were gaps in the schedule. Mm -hmm. And as John mentioned, we we are really trying to trying to get three, at least three people counting within each of those kind of four hour periods. So putting these as our slots, um, hopefully we'll get three out of four of those in those kind of four hour periods throughout the day filled in. So if you have more availability, then you can go to this website and see what slots are left for that day. And if you have the availability to go um, and pick up an extra shift. Okay, thanks. Yeah, this this will also only show what's available. So if someone, if you know, certain time slots already been taken, you won't see it. So there's no worry about, you know, accidentally double booking yourself with another person or anything like that. I'm also hoping to um, send out a weekly email about how we're doing in terms of um, how full our schedule is. And um, on the back end of this pick time, I can see kind of what that whole schedule is. So I will share that in that email with you all. And at that point, um, you know, if we're looking a little bit low on who can do what, um, then you can sign up at that point again. And I'm seeing all of your appointments scheduled coming in my inbox. So thank you all. That's exciting. I just want to know also um, on our website, like right under the button that goes to the pick time link, there is another button if you're having any problems or have any questions about scheduling um, that walks you through how to do it as well. So if you're having trouble when you try to schedule it, um, that should be helpful for you. And if not, just email Lisa or myself and we can help you out. And I see Peter, um, I believe it's April 15th to June 30th. Is that right, Lisa? Yeah, so April 15th to June 30th. Yeah, and we'll be in communication throughout this process. Um, so if there are any questions, again, feel free to reach out. We'll try to send um, kind of weekly update emails about how things are going. And, you know, we'll be reviewing your data as it comes in too, so we can um, highlight some of that. Awesome. Does anyone have any more? Oh, I think there's one more thing that is very important that Ryan <laughs> needs to talk about. One second, sorry. Oh, yes. The So we have um, our waiver. Um, so this is something we require all our volunteers to fill out um, before participating in any of our volunteer forms. It It's very quick. It takes like two, three minutes to fill out. Um, there is a, a QR code for anyone who wants to scan that now and fill it out, as well as a, a link in the slides um, as well. Um, yeah, and if anyone participating is um, under the age of 18, um, we do just require that a, a parent and or legal guardian fills this out for them. And Lisa has also posted the waiver for everyone in the chat as well. You only need to sign sign this once for the whole season, but please do. Awesome. Um, one other question that I got a lot last year that I wanted to share um, was, and I'd love to get John's take on this too, if, if you're still there, John. Um, some people wanted to sign up for back-to-back -back slots. Um, and I know that we want to kind of reduce the amount of like clustering that John talked about in his presentation. But John, what would you recommend? Could we do like 10 to 20 minutes between counts potentially? I would do that. Um, you know, I mean, I, often, you know, I mean, we normally, you know, uh, um, don't recommend doing that for, you know, for the reasons I stated. But, you know, at the same time, you know, this, you know, people are going together they want to you know get involved you know so we understand that you know i you know i think i would uh give us some time in between you know counts <clears throat> thanks john all right any other questions
Does anyone from, um, if, if people were here and involved in this last year, does anyone want to share what their experience was and why you're back this year? Oh, I just realized I'm unmuted. I mean, um, I did it last year. It was, it was great. It was just, I, <laughs> the only thing I wish that we could sit and not have to look through the fence, but, um, other than that, I think it's wonderful. Thank you, Anne. It was easy enough and to do. Just show up, uh, open the box, screen. and uh, put on the sunglasses, and you're on your way. Uh, I went uh, most every week. I was away on vacation a couple times, and I notified Lisa before I went away. I only saw one fish, but did provide the data points that hopefully helped make it meaningful. And I just posted in the uh, chat the uh, Mystic River uh, Organization Watershed Authority has a uh, fish cam, and you can see what some of these fishes look like if you want to go on there. Awesome. Thank you, Alan.